forward and we'll start. Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to the first Nats Chat of 2017. I um, would like to begin by thanking Inside View Press for sponsoring our Nats Chats and it is such a privilege for me to welcome Dr. Wendy LeBourne and Marcy Rosenberg tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here. Exciting. <laughs> so let me just share a brief bit of their extensive bios because these are busy women. Um, so Wendy LeBourne is the voice pathologist and director of Blaine Block Institute for Voice Analysis and Rehabilitation and the Professional Voice Center of Greater Cincinnati. She is adjunct faculty at Cincinnati Conservatory of Music and obviously we all know has written many publications. Um, she also is starting a new blog with Nats and is our Nats Vocal Health and Wellness Coordinator. So please go to our website and um, her first one um, on vocal wellness is on there. And she has written in conjunction with Marcy, my second guest, this incredible resource, The Vocal Athlete. There's also a wonderful workbook that goes along with this. It, I cannot say enough as they know. Um, I'm a big mouth about how much I love this book and use it in my pedagogy class. And I think a lot of what we're talking about tonight will be found in this book. So Marcy is a, a singer and a speech, speech pathologist at University of Michigan, Department of Otolaryngology and Speech Language Pathology. And they are both on the faculty at the CCM Summer Vocology Institute at Shenandoah Conservatory, which this summer will be held July 15th to the 23rd. So welcome both of you. Thank you so much for the generosity of your time tonight. Thanks for having us. So let's, there's lots to cover and um, Nats Chatters, let me encourage you um, to uh, ask your questions. I'm seeing one person that is messaging me saying that they can't see. I'm going to hope that is just on his end um, and his computer and not on our end. So if others are having that issue, let us know. Um, but there are a couple ways you can ask questions of my guests. You see a little virtual hand in the control panel. You can click on that and that indicates to me you'd like to op uh, ask a question and I can open your microphone to do so. The other way is to, there's a box that says questions and just open that box and type a question and I will see it and at the appropriate time I will ask the question of our guests. So let's begin Wendy and Marcy and um, you know from your wealth of knowledge on these subjects of kinesiology and motor learning principles, what is it that you want voice teachers to know? Um, you know, I think one of the biggest things that we had hoped to accomplish with, with this book and entitling it The Vocal Athlete is to really consider our singers as athletes so that as we move forward in the training process of um, pedagogy that we're thinking about them as training muscles. We need to understand motor learning. We need to understand exercise physiology and how skill acquisition occurs in all parts of the body, not just the larynx. So it has to really happen from the bottom of your toes to the top of your head. And I think in um, traditional pedagogy, um, we don't have a huge understanding of motor learning and skill acquisition from a laryngeal, respiratory, and resonance standpoint. It, Traditionally, we have been a master-apprentice relationship and just passing down through the centuries, very, very wonderful information, but I think we have a better way to maybe look at this moving forward because our, our vocal athletes in the 21st century, regardless of genre, are required to do extraordinary things consistently and effectively, and I think we need to understand this. I'll pass it to Marcy um, related to motor learning because that is certainly her expert area. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, I mean, it's so nice to see that pedagogy has, has taken that turn uh, towards the more sort of functionally based vocal training. Um, and in terms of exercise physiology, which is sort of how the body reacts to, acti to physical activity in the long term and in the short term. So that's really just part of the picture. So the motor learning component is really referring to how 
you, the human, integrates the information. And I would and I would say that hopefully what will be clear as we continue to discuss this during this hour is that it's the motor learning component and how we're teaching our students that we're setting them up to either succeed or fail with integrating these new uh, movement systems and patterns into their body. Because the strength is only a very small part of it. And frankly, we don't really even know what is happening to these little muscle fibers in the vocal folds as we think we're strengthening our chest. I mean, sort of in theory, it makes sense that that's happening, but we've not really, hasn't really, really been looked at. So the issue of the motor control and setting up the system to reorganize itself so that the coordination is in place, so that the vo vocal output is efficient to promote longevity and vocal wellness throughout a very, very high high-paced, high-drive, demanding vocal career. So it's gotta be, it's gotta be the, the learning and the exercise physiology coming into play in the studio. Sorry, Wendy, you looked like you wanted to, to No, I, I agree, I agree uh, with Marcy. So let's, let's talk about this from the perspective of, of a voice lesson. Let's actually jump there. Um, how does it look in the 21st century versus the 19th century with what we're beginning to understand? Um, I think we are a little bit behind the times in terms of understanding exercise physiology as it applies to singers. Where we are in dance medicine and sports medicine, they're a good bit ahead from a knowledge base of their elite athletes from a psychological standpoint, from a physiologic standpoint, you know, ballet dancers, they know if they don't have a certain turnout, they're not even considered for certain companies. I mean, they can look at these folks physically and know whether they can handle the demands. Um, we don't have that information quite yet. I think that our vocal athletes, the demands on the voice and the body are extraordinary at this point. Um, but I also think it parallels our sports um, uh, styles as well. I just played for my vocal ped class on this week um, a video of the gymnastics from the 1950s, the world-class gymnasts of the 1950s and the world-class gymnasts of 2017 and the demands on those people and I said okay let's think about the musicals of the 1950s and let's think about what's being written in 2017 and these demands are quite a bit different. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So go ahead, go ahead, Marcy. So, and there's a there's an exercise physiology term um, specific adaptation to imposed demand, meaning that as we train for these demands, as they continue to elevate over the years, that the body adapts to and will accommodate those demands, probably to a certain extent. But I think that that's where the teacher comes into play to really help make sure that singers are safe with how they're doing it because they're, you know, what we hear on a, on a Broadway album uh, is, is a little bit different than what we may be able to produce in the studio and also what the singer might actually be able to produce reproducibly every night, eight shows a week. So, you know, those things need to be kept um, within context when we're talking about building muscle strength and, and those types of things. I think there's a bigger picture. Do you, and I don't know, you go ahead. I would also say in the teaching studio, I think one of the important things, regardless of where your singer starts, is that you as the teacher have a really good understanding of what that particular student's basic function is. And that you have an, a sense of then how to build that voice from wherever they're starting um, to enhance function performance, flexibility, agility, just the same things we would do in an athlete, but from a singing studio training standpoint, wherever they're starting, we can all get better at a task. And um, that is so huge for singing teachers. I want to encourage chatters to ask questions, um, either again, as I said, by raising your hand or just type in the box and I can read, uh, read the questions to Wendy and Marcy. Let's stick with that for a minute, Wendy. So this skill acquisition, you know, what, what advice would you give teachers 
about when they're working with a student, let's say um, in this second register, let's go, well, do you want to stick CCM or classical? Do you, it doesn't really matter for you. I don't think yeah. it really matters. Yeah. <laughs> So, so whatever they're they're working with something uh, um, a registration issue. You're speaking with them about what they should experience. There's got to be principles that you have learned from the studies um, that tell us how to help them train that you know those skill acquisition needs. Right. Absolutely. So, I think one breath management as we we what we know physiologically is as you train change from low to high in your voice whatever you want to call it registration wise because that's a whole nother ball of wax terminology wise when you go from low to high in your voice we know that the vocal folds elongate and that we know that breath flow and glottic closure can change as a singing teacher helping your students navigate that change and understanding the right amount of pressure as they get longer in their vocal folds, faster vibration, different airflow, different intensity. And so that is variable for every single singer. And whether you take them from the bottom up or the top down, to me that becomes a little bit of the art of singing teaching is, is to understand that. I don't know if Marcy has some other thoughts on it. I love that, the art of singing teaching. I love that. Yeah, because you've got to bridge the art and the science, right? So there's the science component. So there's the exercise physiology arm or branch of the of what's happening in the studio. So to use the example of working a singer through a registration, let's say it's a, a newer singer to this and they really don't have a particularly good blend or transition. So from the exercise physiology standpoint, a lot of us are very are very much in favor of doing various semi-occluded vocal tract exercises, which will uh, allow the body to understand what those shifts and changes are. I mean, when Wendy's talking about we're elongating and breath pressure is changing and resistance is changing, we don't need to tell the singer, okay, the vocal folds are getting longer and the breath pressure is changing and the phonatory, you know, that's way too much information, and from a motor learning standpoint, that kind of input would actually hinder learning. But you take an exercise physiology sort of branch, and you just give them an exercise that's going to help to get that job done and help the system to reorganize on its own with as little instruction as possible, frankly, from you. Then those things can come into play. The body starts to understand how to do it. The teacher can then help label it for the student of what they're experiencing but it's that process that has to happen and it's a slow process we don't go to the gym and get fit I mean much to my dismay after <laughs> one day of working with the with a with a fitness coach it's a it's a process and so those changes take time but we have to from a motor learning then standpoint the other arm we have to we have the wonderful SOBT exercise but we've got to also facilitate the learning, which means the way that we provide the cueing and the feedback and what we tell the, the student or don't tell the student can either hinder or promote their actually learning and integrating that specific task so that they can then learn to carry that over into other tasks as well. So you really got to be thinking of all of the, of the branches. And the other thing that I would say, Marcy, that goes along with that, absolutely, you know, you don't want to give that much information. Um, to the singer, but as the teacher needing to understand it, I think also giving the students permission that they may actually sound worse before they get better because you are now giving them a dis different task that they are not as good at. And because of that reorganization of the, of the programming, you actually get a little bit worse sometimes before you get better, and that is very difficult especially when you are in a constant performance situation mm -hmm. um, because you can't really go out on stage and sound worse on purpose. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, Wendy uses the term performance and I, I want to just lead into the difference between a motor performance and motor learning. Yes. Those are very, very, very different things. So learning is sort of you get better by experience and practice and those changes are considered to be 
integrated into your system, they have been learned. Whereas motor performance is really just referring to how you did that particular task in that moment. So I may shoot a ball and get it in the basket, but it did, that's, that was a good performance, an accurate performance. It does not really mean that my body has understood and integrated how to do it from this side of the court and that side of the court and this close and that far away. And that is really more what learning is. And I think teachers sometimes confuse a good performance and a lesson as having learned and integrated a skill. And then when the student comes back to the next lesson, and it's not quite, they're not quite, haven't sorted it out yet, everybody's sort of disappointed. So if you, if you help the student to understand that these errors are actually critical for the long-term learning, the student has to understand when they've not hit the target and what that felt like, and then understood when they do hit the target. Mm -hmm. So that they can, they know what the goal is and they know then if, whether or not their output compared to it. So I think that idea that errors promote learning is really a, it's counterintuitive. It's definitely counterintuitive to teachers who are just starting to teach because we want to get good performances immediately. That's what they're paying us. They're writing a check at the end of the lesson. So we feel like we've got to get a very quick response and that sometimes that's hindering their actual learning. Well, and it's our job to give them, I think, tools and what and uh really spe specificity about how to go to the practice room and practice since we only see them once a week by and large. I mean, long are the days, long gone are the days of seeing your teacher every day, right? They're, that, that you knew that you were really acquiring that skill with uh, guidance. So, well, we're getting lots of questions, so let, let me start turning it over. Um, and, and go through these. So Christy Knickerbocker asks, can you address combining a CCM and classical voice in one performer and types of vocal fold changes that occur thickness and shape-wise? <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> that could be its own Nats chat, too. <laughs> That's <right. laughs> Do you want to start, Marcy? You want me to start? I, mean, I think it is what she's getting at sort of the, the differences in more of a heavier registration, a chest registration. Some people would refer to that as a thicker vocal. I mean, there's sort of different, you know, terminology is its own can of worms um, versus, versus more of a classical um, soprano registration or is that sort of what she was referring to? I mean, in that case, you know, we would talk about a longer close phase, but the problem is, is that the data on on some of these studies with close phase and chest register, it's uh, quite varied actually. The re the sort of what the results are of what's happening with the vocal folds. Um, you know, longer close phase for chest voice versus shorter close phase for for a head registration. But those are such general terms, and I think that there's quite a lot of variation from singer to singer. Right. Wendy, thoughts? You know, my feeling on this is that good singers can sing in a variety of styles. And just like good athletes can play multiple sports, it depends at a very high level. I think at some point you have to choose. You don't see professional football players who also play baseball, although like there's one or two. But generally speaking, they're, they're, they come to a place in their career where they have to make a choice for just what we've been talking about is not just um, motor learning, but also skill building in that area. Um, for me, the, the main difference between my classical singers and my commercial singers from the standpoint of function becomes about resonance and, and, um, and oh. chamber of the sound, honestly. So that's primarily where I work. Um, when I'm transitioning, say, a classical singer into commercial music, um, it, it is bringing the sound a little bit more forward than they're used to. But I still want them to have good closure, um, not being afraid of their chest voice or of using a little bit more thyroid dominant place. But most of them actually know what that feels like. Um, they're just not familiar with that kind of closure and that right of resonance. So that's a little scary for them a lot of times. And vibrato changes are used very differently, I think, in both styles. And I think in terms of the vocal tract shaping, which can be very different for classical styles and more CCM styles, 
sort of setting up a series of experiences for the singer to understand those differences because those the vocal track shapes for that classical style are often very very uh, ingrained into their into their muscle memory for sound production and so for them a, a bright e for example uh, is not necessarily something that they that their body understands how to jump to immediately so um, sort of going through that that process um, as well is, is sort of I think something that I tend to focus on well, great. That's a great segue. I could, um, and please forgive me if I say someone's name wrong, but uh, Marques Carter, how can proper sequencing of exercises in the studio make or break students' steps towards motor learning? I would say, <laughs> you want to do, so we talk, we always talk about we want to have a warm up, a vocal warm up, and then sort of I tend to think of calibrating the voice doing a, a, a nice vocal warm-up to get the voice in the space that it needs to be, then sort of the technical warm-ups, and then rep at the end. But within that, from a motor learning standpoint, um, what facilitates learning best tends to be throwing a couple of different tasks at the singer within a training session. So we're working on skill A, we're working on skill B. Instead of doing skill A for 13 minutes straight and then doing skill B for 13 minutes straight, you're going to alternate those skills. And the reason for that goes back to a, uh, a motor learning idea called the forgetting hypothesis, which endorses the idea that by forcing the brain to constantly having, have to re-retrieve a motor plan for skill A um, versus just repetition, repetition, repetition of skill A where they go on autopilot, the brain is going to better internalize those movement patterns and those sequences for that particular skill because you're taking them with skill A, then you're throwing skill B at them, and then you're jumping back and going to skill A. So they're constantly having to renegotiate the, the, the plan for this skill over and over again versus an autopilot where they're just hitting forehand over and over, just hitting forehand, hitting forehand versus forehand, backhand, forehand up here, backhand over here the errors are going to increase because it's more taxing but the internal rules are more deeply ingrained so that random practice is important for motor skill acquisition within tasks okay um this nice segue into liz schaefer's question if a student is doing consistent organized functional exercise how long does it take for the body to have automatic responses in other words, what are some generic timelines we can tell students to expect while we're building healthy function? <laughs> um, well, from, from the exercise physiology literature, my understanding is that it takes approximately six to eight weeks to affect muscle change and integration. So I think that's a minimum amount of time um, that I think we can expect to see change. Um, Marcy, do you have a different viewpoint on that? Yeah, I mean, we don't know how much that literature translates into voice, as we said earlier, but I think that, that I agree with Wendy, and I think that's a reasonable time frame depending on the singer. I will also add into that the reversibility principle, which is that if you then don't use it, you lose it, and the exercise physiology literature says that if you're out of the gym for two weeks it takes you about four weeks to get back to where you were before you stopped going so again how does this translate exactly into voice we don't really know but I think we've all understood what it feels like to be deconditioned vocally and there is definitely a retraining that has to occur as well I, I will say that on, from a from a voice standpoint one thing we do know is um, Dr. Susan Brem did her her dissertation on respiratory detraining effect, and we saw a detraining effect. She is a respiratory trainer um, with uh, calibrated vo uh, load on the respiratory system over a course of time, and there was a significant detraining effect once they stopped using it um, within, I believe, four weeks. I would have to go back to quote this the study exactly. But from a respiratory standpoint, when they stopped using the inspiratory trainer, there was a fairly quick um, decline in function. All right. 
Um, okay, next question. Don Dulles says, do you, don't you think that it's key for a student to be able to break down and understand the process of why something like an SOVT exercise works and how it works so that they can recreate it without the tool? Yes, but they should do it and experience it first before they get the lecture. So it's experiential learning, which okay. is at least the way I tend to approach is, is I don't give them a big uh, sort of science lecture about, about all the stuff that's cool about a semi-included vocal track, but I will just introduce an exercise to them, let them understand how that impacts their body and their voice, then talk about what's happening with it and why it works. And is that a week later, Marcy, or is that 10 minutes later in the lesson? You let them get started and then they are like excited about it and then it's like, let's take, depending on the student, how far you would go with your explanation. Yeah, it depends, but I'll do it within okay. that within that lesson for okay. sure. I, I don't, you know, I'm not trying to be secretive about it, obviously, and I want to <laughs> back to their lesson. <laughs> but and I, I also want them to understand why it is working and a lot of them are very curious about it because you give them something very simple like a straw and a bottle of water and uh, some of them are really quite blown away at the difference that they are noticing with their output and they immediately want to know why did that work um, but I will always go for an experiential process where they do it first and then they tell me what they are feeling and what they're observing they're providing feedback and then I will step in okay and, and I would say, just to play devil's advocate here, I think we're talking about SOVT done well. And just like any exercise that you do, you know, I can do a plank for 50 seconds but my butt's sticking up in the air and I wonder why my abs aren't getting flat because I'm doing my planks, right? But if I can do it for 10 seconds like this, I'm getting a better exercise. So if you're having students do semi-occluded work and you're not seeing results, I would say let's look at how you're doing it because the diameter of the straw is going to make a difference, how deep it is in water, if you're using water, if you're not using water, the um, material of the straw, so like the turvis or hard straws have a different resistance than the soft straws and we don't want to use paper straws and what you send your students home with what happens in the studio doesn't always happen in the practice room, as I'm sure we're all well aware. So you might send them home um, with a milkshake size straw, and they come back with a coffee stirrer, okay. and they've completely created a hyperfunctional system. Yes. So I think I'm on the I'm on the side of a making sure they're doing it correctly. But if you're in a place where you're not seeing results, um, there's some rationale behind what we're doing and why we're doing it. And we certainly need to understand that as teachers of why we're using a given exercise for any task. I wonder, when you're introducing something like well, the straw is a big one because so many of us use it, in my, my thought process is that that first session with either a patient, because we, you know, we work with injured singers as well, or just a student, is for them to understand what the target sound is and feel is. So if they don't have a reference for what the target is, I'm not going to send them home with that exercise. I'm going to scrap it, find a different avenue in or a different semi-occluded exercise to get the job done. So they've got to understand what the target is um, before you send them home with it. And then you always, I always ask them, show me how you're practicing. It's the first thing I do when I start a lesson is show me what you've been doing. And it's as Wendy said, it often modifies into something quite different than what you uh, thought you were sending them home with. So you always check in. I love that. Uh, let me um, go down a little straw rabbit hole. Uh, glass versus plastic. One of my students came in but, and it was quite large. And uh, what's the science tell us? So in Finland, primarily they use the glass tubes. Um, from my understanding, I've not been to Finland to use them, but I've I've seen it done. Um, but I do actually, the, the wider the diameter of the straw, this, the easier it is right. to produce a target, the target um, result goal. Yeah. Um, I also find that if I'm doing high tessitura work, I prefer for my students a little bit wider diameter. If I want to increase the resistance, I just have them put it deeper in the water because that's going to increase the resistance. I personally like the hard straws. I use the Tervis, uh, you know, those hard plastic cups, the Tervis straws that go in there. I like those better than the, um, 
than the flimsy straws. But I don't. I have not ever used a glass straw, so I can't comment on glass well, I, in particular. My assumption to the student was, was uh, I would I assume that the diameter is more important than the material for results. I mean, different materials do have a little bit of a different resistance. And the thing about the diameter with this semi-occluded vocal tract, since we're talking about tubes and straws, so the wider the, wider the diameter, the less occlusive effect you get, right. but the more it's going to resemble speech because speech is more of an open tube, right? And then the, the more narrow the diameter, you get a greater occlusive effect. So in theory, you're getting more of that back pressure and that unpressing, um, but it's the least, like, like speech output. I tend to start somewhere neutral in the middle. I like the drinking size straws in the water and then I and then I go from there. I also don't take the that diameter up too high because it's it get because it it, it can cause even more constriction. Although singers and especially sopranos when I say show me how you're practicing, they put a straw in their mouth and immediately it's way up it's way up high. So uh, people do tend to like to to go there, at least females tend to, but I tend to stay in a neutral zone to begin with. Okay, great. Um, Randy Wooden asks, from an exercise physiology standpoint, do you have any particular strategies that help singers build stamina? Seems like the demands on singers is ever increasing these days, singing longer periods of time and heavier function. Um. My theory on building stamina, and this is theory, I don't know that there's any evidence to support it from a singing standpoint, is that when I train singers um, for a role or for function, I do it very much like marathon training or, or triathlon training. So you increase for four to six weeks both the intensity, the frequency, and the duration of practice. Um, and you take days of rest, which I think is so vitally important in building stamina. You have to take days of rest so that your body can acquire skill. So at week four, you have a week where you sort of plateau in your training and you maintain. And then you bump it up for another four weeks and then you maintain. And then honestly, coming into major performance week, what most of us do is we ramp up in tech week. You are now integrating costumes, lighting, moving sets, and really late nights and no sleep. And what ends up happening is you're using your voice at 110%. When, I, when we train for half marathons, we taper that week before the race so that you're in peak performance. And we don't follow that um, necessarily vocally. And it's something I think would be really, really beneficial to do. Not that you can't sing during tech week, but that maybe you're not at 110% vocally um, when we're integrating all of these other things, you may actually have a better performance. That's theory. Um, I use it with my singers. It seems to do them well, but I can't, I can't generalize that to the population. And that's fairly consistent with those, you know, the, the, those five exercise physiology principles that, we're, that are in that, that chapter in Vocal Athlete, the intensity, frequency, and overload, and then specificity and reversibility. So the intensity and frequency Wendy was just describing her sort of the four-week plateau, and then you go up to the net, the next, push it to the next level. That's the overload principle, which means if you want a bicep curl of 15-pound weight, eventually you have to pick up a 15-pound weight. Now you have to do it slowly. Slow, slower gets you there faster, is what I always say. So it's it's better to build it up slowly, safely, especially when you're dealing with someone who's a new belter, for example, who's just now experiencing sort of this style of singing and you're, and you're building up their stamina and you're building up their strength. Um, and then specificity is you've got to train what you're actually, you've got to target what you're actually trying to train. So if somebody's coming to you as a new belter wanting to learn and explore that style, then the exercises have to incorporate some level of, of belting so that the muscles understand this is a new demand and they adapt. To, um, to modify for that new demand on them. But you have to do that slowly, especially with, especially with singing. And I also think you have to keep into, in mind the actual skill set of the performer you're dealing with. They might want to sing something that is not realistically within their physiologic capabilities in a 12-week period of time. They can probably do it, but it no matter how much stamina you build up, 
it may actually not be the healthiest choice. And I, I see this happen all the time in high school music theater um, where, where shows are chosen that are clearly very likely outside of the realm of what their physiologic function should be doing for stamina. And so what happens um, is that they overdrive the system and they're trying to build stamina and they crash and burn. On the opposite side of that spectrum, I have folks who do eight shows a week on Broadway, and that stamina looks very different than, you know, the community theater performer. It just really depends on the level. So you have to train stamina differently. I also think you can train strength train and stamina train the respiratory muscles through resistance devices. I truly do believe you can improve glottic flexibility and function through very specific exercises. And then by optimizing your resonance, you make the whole thing a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's where the coordination component, I think, comes in. I mean, we're talking about strength training and endurance, which are critical, especially for some of these hybrid singers who are doing these eight shows a week, and they might be belting in one show and then doing something legit in another show. But we cannot overlook the, the coordination component that has to come along with it. So we train them, but we also have to set the system up to integrate things efficiently so that they're using wise effort as opposed to just effort effort. And as Wendy said, they might be able to actually sing the song, but are they doing it in the best coordinated way and in the wise, with the, using the wisest, most efficient effort to get the job done, or are they just muscling through it? Um, and I think that that's a distinction that the teacher has to help um, understand to tease out when that's happening and prevent it. Cynthia says, professional music theater, I don't have four to six weeks. There's two and a half weeks from first rehearsal to opening night, then five to six shows a week. Yep. She, yeah, true. But if she's already doing professional music theater, right. the assumption would be that she has attained a certain level of vocal athleticism. Yeah. Um, right. has had good training along the way. We're getting, oh, sorry. You know, we see these things, especially in summer stock, you know, when we have the, you know, we're in one show, we're rehearsing for the next show, and you do, you have two and a half weeks. But at that place, you're already at a moderate to high performance level. Then it becomes sustainability um, and not um, stamina building in and of itself, um, because you've now got to be able to sustain that. I think we do have to think about our vocal athletes as vocal athletes. The things we can do physically at 20 are different than what we can do at 40, and that also stands for recovery, and I, we see that in voice. There's a lot of, I mean, you just had a webinar on aging voice not too long ago. So depressing, we're not even going to go <laughs> um, But when we talk about stamina and motor recovery, what happens at 18 to 22 is so much faster than what happens at 32 or 42. And it's not to say you can't do it, but there is a difference. And so the two and a half week time gets more challenging, I think, the older we get, um, just from personal experience too. It's not that you can't do it, but you pay a little bit of a price. Cynthia says, I am singing smarter in my 50s, which is <laughs> good. What you're good. Saying. So we're getting tons of questions, so let's see how many we can kind of rattle through as we're at the 20 minute mark. Um, um, I am interested in how the knowledge of vocal physiology interacts with the sudden with the student's body awareness. For example, when I do onset exercises, I have the students use their two index fingers to visually model the efficient closer, closure of glottis. I have found this to specifically help my students who struggle with breathy phonation. Any thoughts for other ways to bridge somatic awareness and knowledge kinesthesiology? <laughs> encountered in your work. So before we answer the first part of the question, Wendy, would you like to address the use of knowledge kinesthesiology that you have encountered in your work? Since I had this question too, Marquise. <laughs> when, when I saw the, um, the, the web chat, I thought it was a typo because I was talking about kinesiology and it said kinesthesiology, where we think about a kinesthetic sense. And kinesiology has more to do with um, motor skill acquisition. So um, 
I think there's a huge mind-body connection, um, similar to that person using this as their closure pattern. If I'm getting somebody to try to engage a vibrato and they have no sense of it, I will often have them use like what they a violinist would use, so that feeling of this and for whatever reason, yes, we get some of that. So in physical therapy and other aspects, we might call it a distraction technique. So if you're moving their head and they're trying to grab, it's distracting their body and their motor planning from being able to do what they're used to doing. So yes, use it. I'm going to pass it to Marcy so we can get their questions. Yeah, absolutely. And I think whatever is working for that student is the right thing to be doing for that student. I would only caution to not over cue and provide too much of the extrinsic feedback and to let the student sort of provide some of their own feedback and hopefully that student with using this then understands also what that feels like so that they can, when they're practicing at home, they can then carry that over. Um, obviously this then gets faded away, this particular tactile cue gets faded away. Right. Gosh, we've got some great, com uh, this is another long question and then a couple short ones. This is Kate Baker. I just worked with someone today. His voice was locked and I would like to speak about this. I actually worked with his body and the voice went right into place. It was locked in the solar plex area. When it was released, it was great. However, then they get nervous that it, they get nervous. That is where it will tighten when that is tight, the jaw and tongue then gets tight. So how do we get them to release in a performance? Tough question, Kate. <laughs> I mean, so there's this concept of dynamical systems um, with motor learning, and that's the, the idea that the human body is actually very wise, and it has the ability to reorganize and self-organize when put in the right environment and given the right tasks. So it may be that whatever, Kate, whatever you did working with his body, and I'm a big proponent of, of body work and things like Feldenkrais and those types of things can have a profound impact on voice output because by shifting something else in the body we have all of a sudden reshuffled this that mental Rolodex for voice production and the system has reorganized to a certain degree but then the choking up component in the performance setting is, is it going back to its old index cards? Um, that, that's how I tend to explain it to, to students and to patients. We have ingrained index cards in our mental Rolodex for voice production, and it sounds like what, what Kate did with, with her student today is she somehow helped him to reorganize by doing some body work, but those other index cards are still in there, and so in that different setting, in that different environment, there's that choking up um, component. And so it, it's continuing to work through that so that the body understands to reorganize and re-coordinate. And I think um, that those processes can be very, very slow, slow and patient. Slower gets you there faster. Great. Okay, good. So Barbara DeMaio says, um, so this will take us down a, a little bit of a different track. Uh, there is a teacher in our Nats chapter who insists that belting is not healthy and is very upset because we've started having musical theater competitions. I've sung both opera and belt my whole life, but he insists that I am an anomaly and that most singers can't do that. Could you please help me find a way to respond to someone like this kindly? I can't believe we're still having these conversations yeah. personally, but thanks for bringing that up, Barbara. Hi, Barbara. I would say that, you know, people thought Wagner was going to be the death of opera, too, if we went back in time, right? Like, Wagner was going to kill all opera singers, and here we are still singing it today. Um, anytime there's a paradigm shift, there is always going to be resistance, and people also have their aesthetic of what they like and what they don't like. And I don't know that you can always... Um, you know, counteract that other than to say and to continue to teach students to belt in a healthy way because remember that belting happens in moments of time. I do think that if you scream for two hours that you are going to hurt yourself. But belting isn't screaming for two hours. Belting is singing loudly for moments of time in an entire two-hour production. Similar to opera where you are not singing at fortissimo for the entire opera, you're singing in moments of time there, because it becomes a give and take. So I think maybe understanding how belting really 
um, is used in music theater performance and in pop rock music where everything is amplified. Everything is amplified. <laughs> I will reiterate that. And it's not in opera. So right. things that you can do in music theater, you can't do unamplified in a healthy way. Well, that, that's a great segue. Um, someone out, Christy Knickerbocker asks, please address squirrel-team. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> is this a term that is being used? I know of it in the gospel tradition, primarily it's scrubbing, okay. I believe, if that's what she's talking about. Okay. Um, and when I, I've been on a dissertation study where someone's been looking at this, and okay. a lot of it is um, what I would call superglottic vocal chaos. It is, um, when I've seen it, to me, visually, um, it looks like um, the ventricular folds, will do a lot of chaotic vibration. I've oh. also seen the epiglottis vibrate against the arytenoids, which is fascinating because that's how we see kids who've had tracheal reconstructions, who've never used their vocal folds before, they actually will often vibrate their epiglotti against their arytenoids. So it's that very rough um, voice. Interesting. That's all I can say about it. I, assume that, I think that's what she's talking about. <laughs> chaotic, I love that. Um, Gracie Gorey, I like this is an interesting question. What do you recommend to do with a student who says he or she can't feel any changes even though audible and visible changes are present? It's a great question. A great question. It happens um, every so often and I, I mean so for me I, I, tr I see this more in my clinic than I do in my private voice studio but there will be times where I will hear a profound improvement in voice, and the and the the patient will look at me like I got nothing. I mean, I don't notice any difference. I can't tell that that's a resonant hum. They just they can't feel it. Sometimes, if it if it goes on for several sessions, then I have to wonder. You know, at times I get the impression that the that the student or the patient has completely disconnected from their body, and so they actually don't, for whatever reasons. They don't want to have a kinesthetic reference for things, you know, from here down. Um, and I, I think there are all sorts of, of, of avenues and things that you can try with those kinds of um, students, but it's, it's, a slow, it's a slow process. And there have been times when I just feel like they are very shut down. And sometimes I'm, I will refer them for more body work or for other types of outside uh, therapies to help them sort out why they're they're just very disconnected um, from from the body. Great, um, Constanza Roder. I'm so sorry. Oh. Is that, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Um, I have some students that make great progress in lessons and practice effectively. However, they sing in choir five days a week and go back to the old index cards. Any suggestions on how to help students avoid getting backwards in skill development choir? Great question, because those of us in academics, especially, or even I guess high schoolers, um, yeah. What do you? What advice do you have for us? <laughs> okay, so I will just—I shouldn't say this probably in any public way, but I always ask my singers: Is your ultimate goal to be a choral singer or a solo artist? And that, that, that they just have to, at some point, and I, I work clearly in a conservatory where they have to be in choir for a certain length of time. Right. Um, they also have to understand that the body and voice is being used differently in that situation. Um, and for me, for all of my students um, in my private studio, I, they have to understand where vocal neutral is for them. Whatever that means for them, where, where their voice is at neutral, they can go to choir, but they have to come back to vocal neutral before they go sing their music theater or pop rock or whatever it is they're doing. But if they're trying to go from choir to music theater without coming through neutral, that's honestly where I feel like they get into problems. Um, and going back to understanding your voice, understanding what vocal neutral even is, is, is a point. And I would add to that, that's where that cool down becomes, I think, really important. But 
the cool down needs to have a thought process behind it. So when we go back and think about exercise physiology and we think about muscles, we know that we've got agonist and antagonist muscle pairs. So, you know, bicep and tricep is a perfect example. When the bicep is contracted, the tricep is kicking back and relaxing relative to the bicep and vice versa. So we have that with the thyroid and the cricothyroid muscles. So part of the cool down, if you go to choir and you're sitting in soprano one and you're doing light, high, floaty, floaty, floaty for two hours, you're not going to be able to pull out a, a chesty music theater piece and just go there. You've got to bring you've got to bring the system back to what Wendy said, its neutral state before you then gear up and go into another gear. One of the ways that you would bring that down is by actually activating the opposite muscle that you've not been using as part of your cool down. So that means some gentle chest voice if you've been up in high soprano land, you know, you're working on forays requiem, that's, you know, floaty and G's and A's and F's for the whole thing. And then you've got to get back down by, by using some chest to get you back into that neutral place as part of your entire cool down routine. And that's where cross training is helpful too. When you're practicing, if you train your body to be able to go to these different places a little bit more efficiently, you can get to neutral much more quickly. Well, of course you've touched on a subject near and dear to my heart. Let me, a couple of things. So, um, Kate adds, solo artists need to learn harmony. She's referring to choir. So that it's it's good for these young singers to be in, in choir for other when we're not talking specifically voice. Um, and, that, and that she says, just to have them warm down that they can do it. And, and then Barbara DeMaio asks, could you share some of your favorite warm downs? Let me just say that I did a two years of study on this subject. And you can find um, the one of the studies is written in the Journal of voice, there will be a, a sit that's really um, for the medical side of things, more of the scientific side of those articles are written, so it's pretty heavy in that way, but there will be a simplified version of it coming out in the Journal of Singing, but it takes about two years now to get um, articles published in the Journal of Singing, but you can find it um, online as well, my J-O-V article, um, a subjective study on cool downs, but it was geared towards classical singing. So, you know, like you just, we we're talking more, a little bit of CCM tonight as well. So I think the cool downs for female voice in particular would have to be different. Um, if they've spent their day belting, their right. warm downs are going to look very different than the classical singers that I used for my study. But do you, to, to Barbara's question, do you have some very favorites that you tend to I, go to? I do you love to hear them. I use a lot of semi-occluded vocal track with resistance um, in the opposite spectrum of where they've been singing. That's that's probably the fastest way, two to three minutes in probably a five to eight note slide, just up and down, semi-occluded in water, opposite of where they have been working. Um, that's, that's one of my favorites to use. I like gargling as well. I, al I also do a lot of semi-occluded vocal tracks, and I like um, just gargling in a neutral range is also a nice way to do it. But, you know, the thing is the body can be trained to cool down efficiently, but it has to be, but it has to, you've got to have the, the references for that in that mental Rolodex for voice production. So I think, you know, one of the things that I do in my studio and in my clinic is I, I do talk a lot about cool down and and what different scenarios of cool down might look like depending on the singing task that they're engaging in, uh, because they need to understand why they would choose something versus another. And I think that we just have to say here we assume that warm up and cool down <laughs> are doing things for the voice. We know that they do, and I'm not saying don't do warm up and cool down because I think that it's important. But when we think about exercise physiology and warming up, we're thinking about increasing blood flow to the muscles, changing the temperature of the muscles, as well as oxygen coming to the muscles. And um, Mary Sandage has probably done the most work in exercise phys physiology in warm-ups, and Kari clearly has done a lot in cool-downs. Um, what's been really interesting to listen to when I've listened to Dr. Sandage talk about warm-ups is that 
the temperature at the vocal fold level when you warm up your voice doesn't actually really change. And so there may be some other mechanisms in place that when we're warming up, what we're actually doing is maybe tuning our resonators. So um, we're also looking at maybe phonation threshold pressures. How much pressure does it take to actually get the vocal folds into vibration? And that has to do with your breath coordination and vocal fold closure. And so I'm not saying don't warm up and cool down, but I'm not sure we can totally think of it in terms of other skeletal muscles because that may not be exactly what it's doing. So we're talking about cooling down from choral singing into solo classical or choral singing into music theater. What we may be doing is resetting the system. I think. I don't know. I'm going to defer to Kari on the cool down aspect. Yeah, but that's... Yeah, so you guys are, so I think what, what I discovered is that we're still looking for the objective measures and do they exist? So, in other words, is anything happening objectively? What are those measures and can we find them? Um, subjectively, for sure. And so then it's the psychological aspect, which is so equally important for the singer. Right, um, but uh, how we feel about our voice and the vocal health of our voice. So, I, I just think there's a, there's a long way to go at, um, in having objective measures to tell us this is exactly what we know is happening. And the objective measures for vocal warm ups are very varied. Right. That exactly. Oh, right. I meant, yes. Right. So cool down. I'm sure will be even probably more so. But everybody agrees that we feel better when we warm up and we feel better when we cool down. Cool down's not as popular as warm up. I mean, Wendy's colleague, Erin Donahue, and Wendy and her crew looked at this, and what was it, like 120 music theater students, and 90% of them said they warm up, and only 15% of them said they cool right. down. And if anybody needs to do a cool down, it's, it's these guys. So it's, yeah. you know, it's becoming more trendy, but it's, it it's not, you know, it still has a ways to go, I think. Yeah, and I was on one other little cool down study besides yours, um, which I wasn't on yours, but of one other little cool down study where the biggest finding actually occurred 24 hours after the cool down, and the, it took them less effort. If I'm quoting this right. This is Renee Gottliebson. Um, that it took less pressure, less phonation threshold pressure to get the vocal folds vibrating at higher frequencies in the cool down group 24 hours after they cool down. Now, there's lots that still needs to be done out there. Whether that's relevant or not, I don't know that we can apply general population, but it's something interesting to look at. Um, you know, so, I all of you out there, go do some more research, please. <laughs> Kitty Bertolini's 2012 article also is very interesting. Sorry, Marcy, go ahead. Well, I was just saying to, uh, you know, what I tell students and patients is that your your larynx will stay wherever you left it. So, and that goes back to when <laughs> the idea of, of put, get yourself into a vocal neutral. Because if you're in this gear, you're it's going to take you a lot longer to get out of it if you don't neutralize it first. And you're reinforcing this all the time. Yeah. versus reinforcing just sort of lots of variation in, in movement and distribution of effort. Wow. So pick up your toys when you're done playing with them. Well, that's a, that's a perfect way to kind of bring this to a, a, a conclusion tonight. I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions, but as you guys know, we could go on and on with the, the two of you. I do, Cynthia, thank you for bringing this to my attention and reminding me. There are two handouts. There's a handout that Marcy sent to me um, that you can click on. Marcy, do you just want to briefly yeah, share? It, it just talks about the stages of, of motor learning. Oh, there we go. How fun. Thank you, Paul. It, it talks about the stages of motor learning and how you might structure your practice, how you might structure what kinds of tasks to give and how, how you might um, correct them or not correct them. And it, this is sort of a very, it's a very general thing that, that sort of highlights some of the things that are actually in the motor learning chapter. Um, and this is in our text at Shenandoah at the CCM Institute. It's in the textbook because we do talk quite a lot about, Wendy and I talk about exercise physiology and motor learning and some I included stuff um, at that um, level one there. So this is part of that. 
So it's just a nice reference. Well, you guys are a wealth of knowledge. My goodness, we barely scratched the surface, and um, I just cannot thank you enough for for your time. Let me remind Nats Chatters that our next chat is February 12th, and it's with Scott McCoy, um, and we will discuss how much science do we really need to know. So that should be a very interesting chat. Um, and so I'll hope to see many of you there, and you can pre-register now. His chats are always very popular, like tonight's were, so I would not delay registering. And remember that you can see the archive uh, chats as well now um, on nats.org under Nats Chat. So, Wendy and Marcy, thank you so, so very much for joining us tonight. And um, we were getting lots of thank yous coming in, of course. And thank you guys. If you guys will hang out for just a couple minutes, we'll have a quick two-minute post chat, but we'll say goodbye to our Nats chatters tonight. Thank you for joining us, and I'll see you February 12th. Good night. Good night. Lots of thank yous.